All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. My name is Serena Longo, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm so pleased to introduce this virtual event with Will Haygood presenting his new book, Colorization, joined in conversation by Peter Goralnik. Thank you so much for joining us virtually this evening. Harvard Bookstore's virtual event series continues this fall, bringing authors and their work to our community and our digital community. Find our event schedule at harvard.com slash events, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and shop our shelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll get through as many as time allows. This event will also have auto-generated closed captioning available. Depending on the version of Zoom you're using, you may need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. You can also disable captions using that same button. In the chat, I will soon be posting links to purchase colorization on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you as always for tuning in and purchasing books for Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate the support. And finally, as you have no doubt experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And so now I'm delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. Will Haygood is the author of Tigerland, which was a finalist for the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, Showdown, a finalist for the NAACP Image Award, In Black and White, and The Butler, which was made into a 2013 film directed by Lee Daniels. He has been a correspondent for the Washington Post and the Boston Globe, where he was a Pulitzer finalist, and he is currently Bodwe Visiting Distinguished Scholar at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Joining Will on our digital stage this evening is acclaimed critic Peter Goralnik, author of numerous books, including his two-volume Elvis Presley biography, Last Train to Memphis, and Careless Love. They're here discussing Will's new book, Colorization, 100 Years of Black Films in a White World. Publishers Weekly calls it an engrossing account of a vital but often slighted cinematic tradition full of fascinating lore. And Dwight Garner writes for the New York Times, this is sweeping history, but in Haygood's hands, it feels crisp, urgent, and pared down. Like a good movie, it pops from the start. We're so pleased to be hosting this event tonight. The digital podium is yours, Will and Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here with you. I wish we were here in person. And Me um, too. congratulations on the book. Um, we've known each other a long time. We've known each other over 30 years. And all that time, you know, I feel like we've been not so secret cineasts. Yeah. And at last, you've come out and declared yourself. And I wondered, have you always had a book like this in the back of your mind? Um, a big book resting on the twin pillars of art and social history and storytelling, too. Uh, or maybe more to the point, how did you come to write the book? Yes, well, um, lovely of you, Peter, to be here uh, with me. Uh, you, you've been a dear friend uh, and an inspiration over the years. So I just wanted to say that. Um, when I was a kid growing up in Columbus, Ohio, uh, my first journeys outside the home, solo journeys, were to the Garden Theater on North High Street. I was uh, nine, 10 years old, nine and 10 years old when my mother first started letting me go to movies. The ritual would be go to church, come home, then change your clothes, then you can go to the movie. And so she would give me 50 cents. It cost a quarter to get in and the other quarter was for my snacks. And I sat there like we all do in awe of the magic of cinema. And so there's this little kid looking up at the 60 foot wide screen. And on that screen, there were stars like Lee Marvin, Liz Taylor, Henry Fonda, Robert Mitchum, uh, 
Robert Vaughn, Paul Newman. Uh, these were all people who I just grew very fond of. They were movie stars, but they all had one thing in common. They were all white. As a kid at the Garden Theater in the 60s, I never saw a black face on that screen, never. And so I went away to college in the 70s and I come home and then there was a new theater downtown called the Southern Theater. And they were showing uh, cool hip black movies like uh, Superfly and uh, Lady Sings the Blues uh, and uh, Shaft. Uh, movies with great urban musical scores. And then years after that, here I am on a movie set in New Orleans. Uh, I hate to name drop, but uh, there was a soiree at a house. It was Sandra Bullock's house, the actress Lee Daniels, uh, who directed the butler from, that was based on the story that I had written. Uh, he had a soiree one evening and I'm in the kitchen and I'm looking out over this, over this crowd, multiracial cast uh, was in that movie. Jane Fonda, Forrest Whitaker, Oprah Winfrey, Lenny Kravitz, uh, um, uh, Mariah Carey, uh, uh, Jane Fonda, great cast. And I said to myself, my goodness, somebody needs to write a book about this moment. And then Terrence Howard, who was also in the movie, walked over to me and he said, well, you're the writer, so you ought to write the book. And that really was the evening back in 2012 that the idea for this book was born. Well, that's pretty cool. I didn't realize it went back to that specific kind of a moment. Yeah. Uh, but now it's a it's a very different kind of a book in some ways than your other books, than your biography of Sammy Davis Jr., than your great biography of Sugar Ray Robinson or um, Adam Clayton Powell, all these, or the or the Hagos of Columbus for that matter. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it seems to me what it has in common uh, is it's it's the storytelling. I mean, it's like a master class in storytelling. Um, colorization, you know, with all these unexpected um, connections folded within the stories you're telling. So you get, well, you get the, an obvious one like uh, the Sidney Poitier, Lorraine Hansberry, Raisin in the Sun connection, but then you get Harry Belafonte being backed up by Charlie Parker's combo. Yeah. You know, or you have Zora Neale Hurston and Fanny Hurst when you're doing the uh, imitation of life, the many permeations, you know, of passing, like the movie that's out now. Right. Uh, or just a fascinating evolution of Poggy and Bess across all these different cultural barriers. You know, so you go from Gullah to Gershwin with Sammy Davis Jr.'s impromptu uh, audition for Samuel Goldwyn, um, first sort of a formal one. And then I think it was, was the other one in, 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 the, in a restaurant or a club. Uh, but in any case, yes. all of these things are just, it's full of such vivid anecdotes and such telling detail. So, but I wonder, did you, what did you take from the, say the discipline or the lessons that you learned from writing these biographies, from writing the extended profiles you did, uh, you know, for so many years on figures as different as Marion Barry or James Baldwin and William Styron, you know, or Eugene Allen, the White House Butler. Uh, did you find, were there lessons to apply to bring over from there or, do, and, and or, was it, you know, did you, did you sense the differences in writing this? Did you have to find new ways of telling the story? Uh, one of the things that uh, has driven me as a writer is that I love to find a side door or an attic door uh, to go into uh, and run down a story. I mean, so many people go in the front door and they just get the story that's right in front of them. Uh, but 
if I go through a side door, or if I jump down through the chimney, you know, if I go at a story in an odd angle, and then I come up with these, it seems to me, uh, riches, riches, uh, like, you know, cinema was still new in 1915, and yet he was the president of the United States, Woodrow Wilson, showing uh, that very racist movie, uh, The Birth of a Nation, in the White House because Woodrow Wilson had a friend who wrote the novel that the movie was based on. But one of the fascinating things for me in that chapter was to find the maid of the director. Uh, D.W. Griffith had a black maid and she was brave enough to stand up to him uh, after she had watched some scenes of that movie. And she walked up to him uh, one day in his study and she said, uh, you have hurt me, Mr. Griffith, by what you have done to my people, period. You have hurt me, Mr. Griffith, by what you have done to my people. And I just thought, wow, imagine what courage it took for this black maid to tell this famous white movie director who paid her weekly, how she told him that he had hurt her through this magical thing called uh, cinema. In movies, you sit in the theater and yet the real world is just 70 feet away out the front door. And I thought that if I could find the off-screen story to tell along with the on-screen story, then it would be pretty fascinating because Hollywood uh, lags behind the reality of this country. The reality is that there were people fighting racism uh, on the streets and they were dying for it. But we didn't see civil rights movies in the 50s, even in the 60s. It was very rarely that a movie in that a movie talked about race or racism. And when it did, it was in a very happy manner, almost. Sidney Poitier, he played a lot of figures who didn't really have a edge to him uh, in many of those movies. Some did, he did his best, uh, uh, but Hollywood was really very slow to translate what was happening in the country uh, 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 to what was going on on screen. And, uh, and the Western director, John Ford, says something to the effect, if there's the truth in the legend, always print the legend. And the legend in Hollywood is hooray for Hollywood. Uh, but if you tell that story up against African-American history, uh, then you really come out with a completely different story. And one that is as epic as the lifeblood of Hollywood itself. Well, yeah, no, I mean, and, and going back to the first black filmmaker, the dominant black filmmaker of his age, which I want to get to in a second, but you touch on a movie like Nothing Like a Man, for example, with Ivan Dixon and Abby Lincoln, which yep. really does tell much more. It's almost a 90s movie in a certain sense, made in the whatever it was, around 1970 or so, maybe. Or... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Nothing But a Man. Yeah, beautiful movie. Yeah, no, I mean, really ahead of its time. And there it is in the book. But also, you know, when you talk about looking for the different angle, everything's about the angle of perception in a sense. 
And I always think uh, about my friend, the photographer, the great photographer, David Garr, who said, if every photographer went to the right of the stage, I went to the left of the stage because it gave him a different angle. Well, for instance, it was Gone with the Wind, two angles you have on it are Hattie McDaniel, uh, won the first black, won the first black, was the first black woman to win an Oscar. Yep. And um, uh, she, but your backstory of her life and her brother's lives in uh, minstrels, in black minstrel shows. Yes. Um, it just gives it such so much more of an edge. And when you go into that and the whole thing of minstrelsy and it's an integral part and in the same similar way, and you, you may, you, you, you could have lots more to say about this. You talk about Margaret Mitchell and the, you portray a, a young woman who goes off to college, discovers there are colored people there and goes back home again and uh, writes a novel, which is a huge success with, with a movie based on it. Um, Martin Luther King, uh, uh, Martin Luther King, who was then um, not Martin, but anyway, singing in the choir at the opening of the show. Yes, but, that, that, that. but you've also got the conversion of Margaret Mitchell when her maid, again bringing in the maid, when her maid can't get medical help, and she then donates money to um, who is it to to the uh, uh, Morehouse Medical School. Right. Right. Morehouse, yes. Um, that's a very beautiful story in its own way and for its time. Margaret Mitchell had had a black maid uh, who got very sick. Uh, and Margaret Mitchell was astonished that she couldn't find a hospital to admit and care for her, her black maid. And even though Margaret Mitchell was willing to pay the bill, mm -hmm. uh, no white hospital would take and care for her maid. And so Margaret Mitchell had to bring uh, this lady home and she died mm -hmm. uh, because she couldn't get medical care in Georgia. Um, it affected Margaret Mitchell so much that she wrote a letter to Benjamin Mays at right. Morehouse and told him, I would like to contribute some money uh, to train or to help train, uh, help fund the training of young black medical students. Uh, but she was so afraid that word might seep out in high society that she, a white woman, had helped black students that she asked, uh, she asked Benjamin Mays, the head of Morehouse, to keep it quiet, uh, which, he, uh, which he did, but she continued to send money, uh, uh, which was very nice of her, but it also showed that she had lived in a completely different world than her black maid uh, who lived in a, you know, Jim Crow world in Georgia and was not treated as other human beings who were white were treated. Uh, uh, and of course that novel, uh, has been praised by many, many, many uh, whites through the years and still this. And blacks had a completely different perception of that novel uh, as they should have. I mean, it's racist uh, stereotypes in the novel uh, and yet it, it, was, it was a very successful uh, novel uh, and so was the movie and the movie directly led to the casting of uh, Hattie McDaniel mm -hmm. uh, and her character had one name Mammy Mammy I mean she wasn't even considered human enough to have a first and last name it was just Mammy 
Uh, and that really too uh, was what cinema thought of, of the black female, that they were only suited, best suited to play maids. Well, and it's like you tell the story. I mean, I, I was just gonna go back and say, so this is not a redemptive story in terms of Margaret Mitchell, but it gives shadings that didn't exist otherwise. And, and uh, I think you, you write that prior to that, she had turned down Benjamin Mays, Mays uh, you know, in his request for a contribution. And yes, yes, yes. Mays. So, so, I mean, it's, uh, but um, no, it seems to me that that in so many ways shows the slow degree of evolution that takes place over a long period of time. I mean, this is, your book is almost like a very slow reveal <laughs> because, yeah, yeah. because what, is, what was so obvious, not just to the black population, but to large you know, elements of the population, but not to the you know, mainstream, let's say. Right. One of the racism of Gone with the Wind, both the book and the, uh, but uh, there it was, and it took a long time and took a lot of things, uh, you know, wake up calls and there is, and in none, of the, in none of this, do you get up on a soapbox and say, this is the way it should be, or look, look, here's, here's a complete turnaround, because it, it generally isn't a complete turnaround, but, right. it's, uh, but it's at least some evolutionary step. Right. All right, I, I had a question for you. I mean, did you, did you always want, did you want to become a writer? Did you envision yourself as a writer? And if you were going to be a writer, what you know, sort of writer did you think you might become? Yes, uh, no, I, I did not always want to become a writer. I, uh, when I was in college, I majored in urban planning. Uh, then when I got out of college, I got a job as a social worker and then another job and um, had a job on a weekly newspaper. And the pay was so low that I quit. I moved to New York City in the 80s, it went through the executive training program at Macy's department store. I became a low level floor manager at Macy's. My mother was telling people, my son is running Macy's. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, worked that job for two years. Then I got fired. I just wasn't very good. Uh, one of the store managers said, retelling will is just not in your soul. And I wanted to say, no kidding. <laughs> you aren't kidding there when you say that. And so, you know, I moved back home in the Columbus, Ohio and looked in the mirror and said, okay, you're 25 years old, it's time to get serious, find a career. And I did like writing in college and I did like writing for that little weekly newspaper that I had that job for about five months. And so I started writing newspapers around the country and, and that's how I got in, um, in the newspapers. I went to Charleston, West Virginia, and then I went to the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette then I went to the Boston Globe uh, for many years, and then, and then I went to the Washington Post. But I always knew too that I wanted to write long form stories. I wanted to be able to just sit inside of a story. I really wanted to write uh, things that were big, you know, big wide stories. Uh, you know, and so I would buy the newspapers that happened to give writers a lot of space in their feature stories. So wherever I was at, I, I would always buy the Los Angeles Times and the Chicago Tribune, and I would buy the Boston Globe and the New York Times and the Washington Post, newspapers that had a lot of space because I just like to be able you know, to write long form, it, it, it seemed like it, it would ask a lot of you to keep a story going for 70 inches. And I just like that challenge. Uh, and when I started writing these long form stories, people started whispering to me, you ought to write books. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's very easy to say that to someone, but it's, it's not easy to find your way into, into the book world. And I was at the Boston Globe, actually, in uh, Stan Grossfeld, uh, two-time Pulitzer Prize-winning photographer and a very dear friend of mine, came up with an idea to take a trip down the Mississippi River uh, in honor of Mark Twain's birthday. And so I took that trip, me and Stan, down the Mississippi River, uh, wrote a whole whole magazine issue that was uh, devoted to his photographs and my words. And then I was approached by the Atlantic Monthly Press, and they asked me to turn that into a book. Me and Stan did, and so that was my book, our first book, and then I was off and running in the same light. Well, of course, you mentioned those newspapers. They all had magazines in those days. Yes. So the long form wasn't confined to the news, to the, uh, uh, to the magazine necessarily, but it gave right. a natural encouragement and an outlook. But what strikes me the most about that, I, and that may have been how we met. I mean, I wrote you a letter about one of your early stories. And I don't know whether it was that one or the story about James Baldwin and William Styron. Uh, uh, it was it. that one. It was that the story one, yeah. about the trip down to Mississippi. Right, right. I, remember, and I still have that letter. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that's how we met. Yeah. But, um, but no, what struck me, you know, from the very first, and, it, you know, people can write long, they can use a lot of words, they can repeat words, they can, you know, turn around in circles and stuff. But what struck me, and this is, you know, I, I wonder if you knew you had this, but it seemed to me from the very beginning, there was an emotional impact. There was an emotional core to every story you wrote. And that's what really, from my perspective, is what distinguished your writing from the, from the first that I was exposed to it and then in the books. And was that something that you naturally came to or is it that just the way you, know, you felt and saw the stories was in a sense from the inside out? Yeah. The only way that I think I can answer that uh, because that Peter is a wonderful question. Um, It was my grandmother who raised me Mm -hmm. uh, and my grandparents. I lived with my mother, but it was my grandmother who seemed to take a real interest in me. Uh, my mother had jobs and she was often away working at night. And I think uh, my grandmother was such a sensitive soul uh, that I knew when I went out into the world, she expected me uh, to be good, and to be sincere and to treat people in my stories the way I myself would like to be treated. And so I do look back onto some of those stories uh, um, and there is a, uh, how can I put it? You know, there is a, I don't know, maybe tenderness. There is a tenderness in a lot of my stories. I I even think about this book, my new book about movies, and I break off in one chapter and I write about all of the black actresses who had enormous talent, but were forced to play maid roles. Uh, You know, some of them had the talent to do Shakespeare plays, but they were forced to do maid roles. 
and many of them have never been written about. And I said to myself, even though they're gone, maybe they've got a nephew, a great nephew, a great niece, somebody out there who knows about their, uh, their family member who acted in movies back in the 40s and 50s and bam, now that name is written in this book. It's there, they've been honored in some way. There's a great moment in the book, at least a great moment to me, uh, Lena Horne, beautiful actress, could sing, could act. Hollywood didn't know what to do with her. And she kept getting invited to play maids, mm -hmm. to play maids. And so her father finally flew out to Hollywood and asked to see one of the studio chiefs. And her father said, look, if my daughter needs a maid, I'll hire one for nice. her but she's not going to play a maid on screen. You know, what a beautiful little story. I mean, he gets on a plane <laughs> and insists on seeing the studio chief and saying, uh, I got money, a lot of money. And if my daughter needs a maid, I'll hire one for her. But she sure as heck is not going to play one on no movie screen. Uh, and she didn't. No, it's funny. I was going to bring up that story because it just, uh, but I mean, she, you know, and you know, we're speaking, I mean, just for the audience and maybe everybody in the audience knows this about one of the most beautiful women in the world. Yeah. She never got a role. You know, she, she was, you know, she could have been Ava Gardner. She could have been anybody you wanted, Elizabeth Taylor, anything. Yes. But she was offered maid roles. But, right. Um, and I should point out that one of the things that struck me the most, or one of the things that strikes me in talking to you is, you came up in an age of sort of me journalism. That was one of the predominant things in which often writers showed off and probably still do at the expense of their subjects. Right. You know, which isn't right. hard to do, it's easy, it's easy to do. Right. And, and I just want to second what you said, which is you've never done that ever in anything you've ever written or anything I've ever written. Maybe you're hiding the rest of it. Thank you. you. Know? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but I've, uh, all right, now I, I had a thought. I mean, I felt sometimes reading this book and it reads, it's a wonderful narrative. I mean, it's a big book. It takes in a lot of subjects. It covers everybody from, you know, Trayvon Martin. I mean, every, the, it's a social history as well as a movie history. Yeah, yeah. But I felt like and sometimes it must have been like uh, coming home or revisiting old friends for you. So the people like Sugar Ray Robinson, you know, Sammy Davis Jr., Lena Horne, Adam Clayton Powell, come up not because you're pulling them in, not because you know something about them, but because they all lived and lived in the same world, occupied the same space. It was a fact of segregation that they were thrown together, whether they chose to be or not. Right. And so I, I wonder, I mean, to me, in a sense, the book, and it's, this is sort of a funny thing because you say, oh, well, it's a history of, you know, uh, African-American movies or the African-American role in movies. But in a lot of ways, it seems to me, it's a, it's a story about community. And I don't know if that strikes you that way or, or not, but I, I just wanted to throw that out to you. I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I think uh, for the black star, the black entertainer, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, it was a fairly small world. Everybody seemed, seemed to know each other. And they all often were so, so proud of each other. I mean, even now, if you watch some of the newsreel footage of the March on Washington, mm -hmm. uh, uh, there weren't a whole lot of Hollywood figures there because many of the managers and the agents of Hollywood actors told them, don't go to the March on Washington. It will hurt your career. And so the ones who did go uh, 
they showed a certain bravery. And so it was beautiful for Lena Horne to be there hugging Sammy Davis Jr., who was hugging Eartha Kitt, who was hugging Ruby D, who was hugging uh, Marlon Brando, who was hugging James Baldwin, who was hugging uh, uh, James Garner. I mean, it was just- well, let's, let's not forget Harry Belafonte though. And yeah, of course, <laughs> Harry Belafonte, who was very close to Martin Luther King Jr. and helped raise money. Mm -hmm for the March on Washington. And, you know, these were people who read Jet Magazine, Ebony Magazine, Sepia Magazine. It really was two worlds in this, in this country during that era. Uh, I think sometimes, uh, or often students, who I teach will think that all of this just sort of happened naturally. Right. right. You know, blacks and film and blacks and TV. No, it's been a struggle up a hill. Uh, and I just found it very fascinating uh, uh, to weave the threads together of this whole march uh, toward, toward cinema, uh, toward representation right, right. in cinema. Uh, you know, because movies are big. I mean, we send our movies all over the world and foreign foreigners often shape their shape their attitudes about this country by our movies. Uh, you know, and so that's both, I don't know, not good and sometimes often bad that our movies uh, shape foreign feelings about, about this country. Well, which is why you want to grab control, you want to you know, declare, you know, an independence of spirit and an independence of identity and, and do a representation that's truer. Uh, but one of the right. things that struck me just in terms of the community was this is so much the theme of James Baldwin, let's say in the fire next time. I mean, talking about all the wonderful things, all the right. great things that come out of that closed community. Right. Uh, and, um, and it's also, you know, I should point out to, because I think everybody who is watching is going to want to buy not just this book, but the complete Will Haygood Irver. And I'm pointing them towards specifically towards the Sugar Ray Robinson, whose intent is not just to uh, provide a biography of, a, you know, a great boxer and a person, a, a very debonair man. Right. But, but also of this community, of this world, of the way this world flowered and expanded and I, yep. it strikes me that some of that is in is in uh you know is in the new book uh it is yes yes you're exactly right i mean i think that the and i think that if you follow the trick of black of blacks in cinema if you follow that trick uh, as I do in a uh, uh, hundred, hundred plus years. And I've used cinema as the spokes wheel mm -hmm. to tell the story of this country. Uh, it's like James Baldwin said, I love this country so much that I have the right to criticize it. Mm -hmm. And so, I love this country very much and I love movies very much. Right. And it seems to me to tell the twin stories in a way that's honest, uh, in, in a way that really utilized all of my skills, um, then I think that I have something uh, in that great 
arc of storytelling uh, to share with the world. Well, yeah, and, we, and in that sense, it's it's a personal book like all the others, even though it has less the appearance of that than some of the others. You're right. You're right. Now, I, I had two last questions, and, and we may get interrupted because we, there may be questions from the reader. So you can choose which you want to answer first. Okay. One was, one was I wanted you to talk a little about Oscar Michaud, uh, you know, the founder of the Black Cinema and the person who has is, is a name I think that you're rescuing from history to some extent. I know there's been writing about him. I wonder to what right. extent uh, you know his films uh, have been shown in recent years. But the other thing I wanted to ask you, and it's like I say, you can choose whichever you want, you want to. Okay. But which of these movies, or any other movie, in the same ballpark, you know, of, of what you're writing about, which of these movies still hits you the hardest today? which do you go back to or which, you know, which, which just impinges forcibly upon your memory and your experience? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, you know what? I think I'd like to very quickly answer both. I'm going to answer the second question first. Uh, two Sidney Poitier movies, uh, because I was fairly young when I saw both of these movies. And if you are a young, young black kid and you see somebody on TV, you know, and in the 60s, your parents would really, really grab you and they would really want you to sit down in front of that screen so that you could see somebody who looked like you, same skin color, as you, I mean, white kids uh, had a whole buffet. Oh, they yeah. could see somebody on screen like them, twenty, you know, seven days a week. But and if you were little Will Haygood, no, that didn't happen. You felt fortunate. You felt extremely giddy when you saw. Sidney Poitier in Lilies of the Field, where he played a handyman who helped some East German nuns who were living in the American Southwest finish, he helped them finish building their chapel. Uh, and it's a movie, and I think it still stands up even though his race is never mentioned in the movie. And that's problematic. He has no history in the movie. His only history actually is that he's a good man. Right. And it's about goodness and that's fine. We can take that. Uh, uh, and then the other movie is another Sidney Poitier movie in the heat of the night, I think. Uh, that was so beautiful. It was a 1967 movie and it showed a black man using his wits to help solve a crime in the South. There was terror going on in the American South in 1967. And it took Norman Jewison, who was a director, and Rod Steiger and Sidney Poitier all had to team together to make that movie, which was very brave. Uh, especially if you look at those two movies, 1963 and 1967. Of course, Sidney Poitier won his Best Actor Oscar in uh, 1964 for his role in 1963's Lilies of the Field, he was the first black man to win a Best Actor Oscar. Uh, and so those are just two seminal yeah. movies. Uh, going back in the Oscar Michaud, unsung heroic figure of cinema in this nation's history. Uh, was born in the Midwest, uh, uh, he moved to the Plains uh, in South Dakota. He got money from the Homestead Act. 
he got lonely at night, started writing novels. Uh, uh, it was always in the back of his mind that this racist movie was still playing around the country. Uh, in the movie I refer to as uh, The Birth of a Nation, right. Oscar Michaud thought he could turn some of the novels that he self-published, he thought he could turn them into movies. Uh, and he started writing scripts. Uh, he raised some money. He started making small short films. Uh, nobody in uh, Hollywood wanted anything to do with him. So he had to go around. Uh, he raised money. He sold his books literally out of the back of his car. Uh, he saved money. Uh, he bought some film equipment and really, I mean, he was old school, old school. He made his movies and he went to black theaters and he asked them to show his movies. He was so new, you know, and they started showing his movies and things grew from there. Uh, he was this nation's first serious black filmmaker and he he plays a huge role in this book well i mean he he and he and the story is so idiosyncratic and he was you know you say he wrote novels well he, he did write novels but they were so autobiographical I mean, he yes. himself to, he's 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 grow, he doesn't well, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And there he is in south dakota his hero is in south dakota he has right. a bad marriage his hero is a bad marriage the father-in-law sues him you know it's like yeah uh, he makes a movie I, about that yeah yeah and yeah. so i mean it's just it's both a wonderful story but also an inspiring story in the sense that you know it it this is a person who's just fighting the odds i mean talk about a sydney poitier role or something right you know, right it, he's fighting the odds and he's doing it in a, in a way that is so striking and so idiosyncratic. So it's a wonderful story. Now you've got to make a movie about him. He's That's amazing. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. I, I, yes. I'm hoping that this book really brings more attention to him, you know, into all of these unsung mm -hmm. figures, heroes and heroines. There's yeah. some great stories in here and there's some great white heroes in this book too. Whites who, who tried to expand filmmaking and, uh, you know, who's, you know, who have landed on the right side of history and their stories are told in this book as well. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Well, I see Serena in the corner yes. of the screen. And, I'm back, uh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have some great questions from the audience here. Um, so let's just jump right in. Um, we have one question here. How would you describe the evolution of racism in film from when you were a child to the present day? So there's a nice big, uh, big opening <laughs> question there for you. <laughs> yes, you know, I had, you know, said at the beginning of the, of the talk that when I was a child, you know, I went to the garden theater in my hometown in uh, Columbus, Ohio, uh, and I never saw any black figures on the screen. Uh, and so, you know, things are much different now, of course, and I'm very happy, very happy that they are. Uh, I don't think Hollywood uh, has moved as fast as they could have, of course. I think we had two years, 2015 and 2016, where uh, where there were no black nominees for the Oscars and that started the hashtag Oscars, Oscars so white, uh, which made national and international news. It put Hollywood on the front pages of newspapers and Hollywood likes to be on the front pages of newspapers for when their movies make a lot of money or their movies win awards. They don't want to be on the front pages of newspapers around the issue of uh, race. Uh, and that's what happened for two, two straight years. And so, um, you know, I think Hollywood has the talent to do much better. Look, it's only been in the last year that we've seen TV commercials with interracial couples. 
It's only been in the last year. And with, with same-sex couples, this is 2021. And we've had mixed race, mixed race marriages <laughs> for many decades. But for some reason, somebody on Madison Avenue or in Hollywood did not deem it safe enough to have a black man and a white woman in their in their biracial child in a TV commercial uh, until this year, literally until this year. So I think that the forces in Hollywood have to move faster because in this, uh, I think that the, the society is moving, is moving quicker than Hollywood. All right, uh, lots of questions here coming in now um, and okay. a few more minutes. So we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, sorry for any folks we aren't able to get to. Um, we have a question from Alex here. Uh, how does the history of black television intersect with that of black, intersect with that of black cinema? Mm -hmm. Well, here's one vivid story about that. Alex Haley. He was, uh, he was a writer, he was a journalist uh, who had been working on this novel, actually it was a nonfiction novel, you know. Uh, you know, it was a story and that was based on uh, his family's history from slavery up until the 1970s. Uh, in that book, when it came out, it was called Roots, Roots in Hollywood, one of the big studios uh, purchased the rights to Roots. They were going to make a big movie, uh, a big saga, slavery, right up to modern times about in this Black man's family. But the studio was being slow of foot. Haley got upset. He figured that they we're not going to make the movie. And so uh, he bought the rights back. He took it to TV and then it became a, a mini series in 1976, Roots. Up until that time, uh, it was the most watched TV mini series in history. But Hollywood ran from the story and uh, and that, that book, that story was saved by TV, by the small screen. Uh, 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 David Wolper, uh, he was a TV producer. He had, uh, you know, uh, uh, he had the wherewithal to do it and he really wanted to make it. And it won a lot of awards. Uh, uh, many of those uh, stars in the movie, though, uh, even with their success in Roots, could not find work on, on the big screen in the 1970s. And I tell that story here in the book. Great, thanks. Um, Alana asks, how far into the present day do you address in the book? Do you discuss movies like Black Panther and or Get Out? And if not, how do you feel about these movies? How do you feel these movies play a role in the history slash evolution of Black folks slash Black community in movies? Alana, I certainly do. <laughs> Ryan Coogler, uh, uh, Ch uh, Chadwick Boseman, Jordan Peele, they're all in this book. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it really is a sweeping history. Uh, uh, you know, all of the current names that we know, uh, uh, they are here in this book. That's great. And that leads sort of interestingly into this next question. Um, which is, do you have an opinion about recent film slash series that put African-Americans at the center of narr narratives that they've been kept out of in the past? I'm thinking especially of shows like Hollywood and Lovecraft count, uh, Country. Yes, 
long overdue. I'm very happy to see that this is happening. It's happening more on the small screen, uh, you know, and that's a good thing. I mean, Hulu is doing some great work. Apple is doing some great work. HBO, Showtime. I mean, there is some great work being done on the small screen. It seems that the people who run the small screen and the streaming services have just spread their uh, uh, their arms and they've said, come, we will set up a writer's room and you can go do your thing. And I think that that is a very beautiful thing. And I tell some of those stories in this book as well. Great. Um, just, I think we have time for a couple more. Um, Nell says, uh, did any pivotal behind the screen, behind the camera change makers come up in your research about the changing perceptions of black art and black film actors? I often think about the bias towards whiteness that has been evident in color film exposure and reference cards, makeup, hair, and lighting even today. Oh my good. That is a great question. Uh, who asked that question? Uh, that Nell. Nell, thank you, Nell, for that question. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, it was Lee Daniels and the director who made a movie called The Butler that was based on a story that I wrote. And that story was about a man who was a butler in the White House for 34 years under eight presidents. And so you had two ways to go, I guess, if you were making that film, you could focus on the eight presidents who were all white, or you could focus on this man, black man who was a butler and show all of the things that he went through in his life. He saw the civil rights movement, uh, you know, he was there when, and when folks were murdered, he met Martin Luther King Jr., he met Sammy Davis Jr., he met Frank Sinatra, he met, he met Michael Jackson, all these people coming into the White House. Lee Daniels chose to focus on the butler, on on the black man, it wasn't a white savior movie, which Hollywood had a tendency to make those kind of movies. So I think if you get a sensitive movie director like Lee Daniels, and then you will see that they will focus on who the story is meant to be focused on. There was a story that came out, a movie that came out in 1988, Mississippi Burning, about the three civil rights workers who were killed in Mississippi. And the stars of that movie were two white men played by Willem Dafoe and Gene Hackman. They were the FBI agents who supposedly cracked the case. Nothing was further from the truth. There were no white, F there were no white FBI agents in Mississippi in 1964, but the movie made you think that there were. Uh, it did not focus on the brave, the very brave uh, black souls in Mississippi who had been, weak, uh, who had been beaten, uh, uh, murdered, uh, and who had been marching for years. And so the lens, the lens in the soul of the filmmaker matters. You had Ava DuVernay who made Selma, which was a Titanic movie to me. Uh, and she should have been nominated for an Oscar and she wasn't. And that's a shame. Uh, but, you know, she is a great filmmaker and she's going to she's going to do a lot of great things during her career. And I tell that story of Selma and her role and how the movie got made and her backstory. I tell that story about Ava DuVernay in this book. So um, 
It is a wide sweeping story with a wide angled lens. Thank you so much. I think that's a, as good a point to end on as any. We're right at eight o'clock. Um, this has been really just wonderful. Thank you both for being here. It's, it's, it's just a really important, interesting thing to, to spend time thinking about and talking about um, and really appreciate both of you being here to, to shed some light on it. Um, and, and we're all really excited about colorization um, and hope that all of you out there will check it out. Um, I just dropped the link into the chat again, um, so it should be easy to get to, but you can also just find it at harvard.com by searching colorization. Um, any last words, either of you? I want to thank you, Peter. I want to thank all of the viewers. Uh, someone said this book in some ways is a love letter to Hollywood. I, I think that there are moments when you will read the book and you may think that, which is nice, you know, and, but it's also a very truthful uh, story. Uh, a someone who now is in movies in Hollywood uh, phoned me the other day and he told me that he thinks this movie will help. I mean, that he thinks this book will help every black actor, actress, cinematographer, film director, dresser, hairstylist, et cetera, in Hollywood. And I hope it does. Thank you both. Um, and thanks to all, everyone who submitted questions. We had a lot and they were great. I'm sorry, we couldn't they get were. to all of them. Um, but again, uh, a huge thank you to Will and Peter for this conversation and to all of you out there for spending your evening with us on behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Keep reading, pick up colorization and stay well. Thank you. Bye-bye, Peter. Bye-bye, Serena. <laughs>